Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Norquist. Today's guest is historian and political theorist Alan Cahan, who lives in France as a professor of British civilization at the Université de Paris-Saclay. He has written books on a variety of thinkers, especially Alexis de Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill. But today, we're here to chat about his most recent book, which came out just a few weeks ago, Freedom from Fear, An Incomplete History of Liberalism. As always, if you enjoy this episode, we would really appreciate any ratings and reviews. You can also find out more about the James Madison program and what we do here on Princeton's campus at jmp.princeton.edu. With no further ado, I hope you enjoy. Alan, welcome to the show. It's a real delight to have you. Thank you very much, Nika. I'm very pleased to be here. So you've written this book. It's a history of liberalism. And when someone asks, are you a liberal? I think the first obvious question is, well, what is a liberal? We probably don't want to get, you could probably spend the whole conversation just talking about this, but just kind of to kick us off here on a surface level so we know what we're talking about. How do you define liberalism? And particularly, your book is called Freedom from Fear. Um, What is it that we need to be afraid of, that, that we need to have an ideology of liberalism? So those are two good questions, you know, how we define liberalism and what are we afraid of or what (laughs) ought we to be afraid of? So I spent decades literally trying to find a one sentence definition of liberalism that would both make sense to the average person in the street and actually say something from a scholarly and academic point of view. And what I eventually came up with is indeed the the first line of the book just about that liberalism is the search for a society in which no one need be afraid. Now, that doesn't mean that liberalism can do something for your fear of spiders or your fear of the dark or your fear of death. What it mostly means is that liberalism has been a way so that you don't have to be afraid of other people and in particular afraid of people in uniform. The soldiers, the police, the priests, whoever might come and drag you out of bed. Now, what liberals have been afraid of, why the police or the soldiers are are coming to get you, that has changed over time. Uh, Academics will recognize that the liberalism of fear is a a very well-known article by Judith Schlar published a few decades ago. One of the things that distinguishes my work from her is she sort of generalizes fear. She doesn't historicize it very much. My argument is that over time, liberals have been afraid of different things. So that, for example, the the so-called proto-liberals, or at least what I call the proto-liberals, are typically afraid of religious fanaticism, and general royal despotism. When you get into liberalism proper, that is the period when people are actually using the word liberal with a political meaning. Uh, If you look in the textbooks, you'll find usually a date of 1810 when there's a Spanish political party that's called the Liberales. Uh, Historians keep pushing this back further. Now we talk about the mid 1790s in France. In any event, this first wave of liberals so-called, what they were primarily worried about was revolution or reaction, the Jacobin or Napoleon. And in one form or another, this fear dominated liberal thought throughout the Western world uh, until roughly the years 1870, 1890, what I call the fin de siècle, when liberals added a new kind of fear, a rather different kind of fear, the fear of poverty. That is to say, until this period, liberals were afraid of the poor because the poor were often either revolutionaries or reactionaries. Now, the the, the peasant religious fanatics or the urban proletariat uh, trying to to bring about anarchy or socialism or, or something of the sort. 
By the late 19th century, it had begun to appear to people the world was now wealthy enough to actually do something about poverty and to recognize that being poor made you afraid of all kinds of people. Um, the, the landlord coming to pull you out of bed because you hadn't paid the rent, the policeman who treated you differently because you were a poor person, laws that often in practice were enforced differently against the poor. And liberals in response to this fear began to decide that something needed to be done about poverty and that the state needed to be brought in to help do it. Now, there's, this led to a split in liberalism between the people I call modern liberals who wanted to use the state to help fight poverty and the people who began to call themselves classical liberals who thought that a bigger state was something to be afraid of rather than something that could be used to combat fear. And this struggle between modern and classical liberalism continued really down to World War I with a common focus on poverty as the thing liberals were, the fear that liberals focused on. Did not get rid of the older fears of revolution or reaction. One thing I like to say about liberalism is it's not a tree, it's an oyster. Oysters grow by accretion. They have layers, one on top of another. They never, no layer ever disappears. You pierce down below one, you can see the other. The fear of revolution and reaction or of religious fanaticism doesn't disappear. But most liberals in the fin de siècle focus on poverty. After World War I, the focus of liberal fear changes again. We've got World War I, we have the Great Depression, and now we have fascism and communism. And this focuses liberal minds on totalitarianism in various forms. And liberals generally recognize that whatever they had done before, it was not an adequate response. Uh, or we wouldn't have totalitarianism. And so liberals put their heads together and they try to overcome the divisions between classical liberalism and modern liberalism. You see this very clearly in people like the, certainly the early Friedrich Hayek, uh, who is quite vitriolic in, of all things, denouncing laissez-faire, because laissez-faire is at the time associated with A, bringing about World War I, not a good association, but one that's universal at the time. Um, and B, meaning you um, didn't really care about problems of poverty. You recognized that the liberals had to address them if they were going to have any response to totalitarianism. And he and many other people who get together in the, the so-called Colloque Lippmann held in Paris, uh, and I believe it was 1938, to try to come with, up with a new anti-totalitarian liberalism. This takes shape after World War II two in various forms, the 1950s and 1960s, we have the end of ideology movement. Later on, we have a split between egalitarian liberals, people like John Rawls, and uh, libertarians, people like Robert Nozick, so-called neoliberals, people like Milton Friedman. So this is all a very long answer to say liberals have been afraid of different things over time. Um, and I'll make it an even longer answer by going on to say, when we talk about fear, it's also important to talk about not just what people are afraid of, but who is afraid. Are you afraid as an individual? I said something rude about the government, so they're going to toss me into the prison camp. Or are you afraid because of what group you're a member of, regardless of your individual actions? I didn't say anything about the government, but I'm a Jew in Nazi Germany, so they're going to haul me away. And liberalism is sometimes overly identified with a pure concentration on the individual. Liberals have always been concerned with groups as well as with individuals, with communities, as well as with individual people. And particularly in the 19th century, when liberalism is really first flourishing, often they're more concerned with the fears of groups than with the fears of individuals. Um, oppressed religions, um, oppressed classes. Uh, eventually this will become uh, oppressed ethnicities, oppressed genders, uh, the fears of women at first not taken into account, but then more and more taken into account uh, by later liberalism and so on. So an even longer answer to your question. <laughs> well, there are a lot of jumping off places there, but just 
because I can't resist. I was very interested that at the beginning of like one of the very first things you said was that uh, liberals were very afraid of people in uniform in some way harming them. And then only at the very, very, very end of your answer did the word libertarian come into play. And to me, the, the, that very first thing you said, I thought, oh, like a libertarian, is is there a distinction there? Is libertarian just kind of one small strand or is it something that kind of seeps through the whole ideology? Libertarianism is a new thing. Yeah. Although some libertarians would like to, to pretend that it's the only kind of liberalism that's ever really existed. Uh, they have this in common with many other forms of liberalism. Uh, and it's effectively, it's one of the strands of anti-totalitarian liberalism that developed essentially with the end of the end of ideology movement in the 1960s. Uh, in fact, it's in some ways, and this is not an affiliation that's normally pointed out, but I think it's important to point out what the end of ideology movement was claiming was that deep ideological commitments of any kind tended to lead people to become totalitarianisms, to wish to impose these commitments on everybody else, and if they didn't like it, to beat them until they changed their minds, or if necessary, shoot them. And libertarianism, by completely rejecting all of that, by simply saying that you know the state has absolutely nothing to say in so many different areas, particularly moral and religious kind of areas, was following on the end of ideology movement's claims. Now, the end of ideology movement claimed that this was actually a matter of fact, that in the 1950s, particularly in the United States, era of great consensus on many matters, ditto in Western Europe, uh, Ideology seemed like something old fashioned. We now have we had simply technical problems to solve, a little tinkering here, a little tinkering there. Uh, John F. Kennedy is often thought of as in this very sort of ideological um, figure. But in fact, if you look at his speeches, that's exactly what he's saying. A little rule by the experts here and this will take care of things. Um, by the time we get to the late 1960s, the Vietnam War, the counterculture, people recognize that ideology has not disappeared. But many people think, well, it hasn't actually disappeared, but we wish it would. And libertarians are among those who in certain ways simply want to take ideology out of the realm of government and say that, yes, we can have um, a liberal society. In fact, we must have a liberal society at the price, at the necessary price of very much limiting what the society's role is. And this, in some ways, is a very new development. Uh, originally, I did not set out to write a history of liberalism. I was going to write a book about the kinds of arguments that had been made for liberalism. Mm. Uh, it struck me that many people in the late 20th century had purely economic or purely political arguments for why liberalism was a good thing. But then in the 19th century, it was commonplace for liberal arguments to rest on three pillars, freedom, markets, and morals. That is to say, politics, economics, and morality or religion. And one of the things that happens in the late 20th century, and libertarians are very much a part of it, is that the moral religious pillar of liberalism is either eliminated entirely, uh, Milton Friedman is a good example of this, although I know he's not a libertarian, or very much whittled down to something very, very narrow, comprising essentially choice, but in which there's not a whole lot of positive content. Whatever positive content there is comes from outside of liberalism. 19th century liberals, somebody like Tocqueville, for example, or John Stuart Mill, uh, or for that matter, Herbert Spencer, would have said, you can't have liberalism without a strong moral content. It just won't work. Um, the James Madison, after whom your center is named, certainly would have agreed with that too. He said that a, a, a nation as free as the United States would have been impossible uh, without a certain amount of virtue and unless Americans had been a religious people. That was a commonplace of liberalism 
through the 1880s and to a large extent even until World War I. That's not a common place of, say, libertarianism. And to, to jump the gun a little bit here, I argue at the very last chapter that one of the reasons that liberals have found themselves in considerable trouble finding responses to populism is because they've lost the ability to speak a moral or religious language. Yeah, I'm interested. Well, I'm interested both by the examples of Mill and Tocqueville that you bring up. Mill, I'm a little surprised, I guess, to hear is one of the main people listed on this. But I want to talk about Tocqueville because it really was one of the things that struck me about your book was Tocqueville's discussion about um, freedom and religion in America. Um, And I thought it was so interesting that according to Tocqueville, the relationship between freedom and religion was reversed in America versus France. Can you talk a little bit about that, about what that relationship is in the history of liberalism? Well, Tocqueville himself is probably my favorite subject because much (laughs) of my previous work has has been on uh, the the prophet Alexis. Uh, (laughs) But yes, the relationship between liberalism and religion is both central and highly complicated. Yeah. And has to be discussed from a number of different perspectives before it makes sense. 19th century liberals, with some very, very rare exceptions, were convinced that there was a close relationship between freedom and religion, which at the time in some ways seemed counterintuitive because wasn't religious fanaticism what liberalism had sort of begun to combat? And we will find liberals, you know, a French secularist of 1900 who would say, yes, that's exactly right. But in fact, most 19th century liberals, and even if you scratch pretty hard, that 19th, 19th French secularist of 1900 would in fact admit you need strong moral foundations for a liberal society and that the most commonplace in point of fact where those moral foundations are built is by religion, which does not mean that any religion is okay. Fanatical, despotic religions are clearly not okay. Freedom of religion is a core liberal demand. But some kind of spiritual moral commitments, notions about what human beings ought to be in order to flourish, in order for their souls to flourish, um, as well as their bodies, are central to why lib- how liberals talk about freedom in the 19th century. Tocqueville likes to say that what he's interested in above all is human grandeur, human greatness, and that he thinks it very unfortunate that governments want to do great things and not to encourage the formation of great human beings. And one of the necessary paths to being a great human being for Tocqueville is moral greatness. And religion is one of the fundamental sources of that. And something like this attitude is found very widely throughout Western liberalism. Mill's a bit of a special case. I can come back to him later if you like. But at the same time, this conflict between liberalism and illiberal forms of religion is very widespread and in many ways fundamental to liberalism, really down to World War II. Uh, The book alternates between sections in which I talk about some individual thinkers and when sections in which I talk about subjects, seeing how liberalism worked on the ground. So there's one long discussion of the relationship between liberalism and Catholicism, which was deeply hostile down to the First World War and even beyond it. Hostile, I should add, on both sides. Um, Catholics mostly hated liberals and vice versa. Yes, there were such things as liberal Catholics, but not a whole lot. And the fact that you were the opposite of a Catholic was often central to your identity as a liberal. Uh, I can tell two very brief and sort of amusing stories about this, both of which are in the book. 
Uh, one is that as with anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism, you don't actually need Jews around to be an anti-Semite. You don't actually need Catholics around to be anti-Catholic in the 19th century. There are no Catholics in Norway. There never have been Catholics in Norway. The 1814 First Norwegian Constitution bans Catholic clergy from setting foot in Norway. It also bans Jews from Norway. But that ban is dropped in 1848. The ban on the Catholic clergy remains. 1905, Norway becomes fully independent. Now we will allow Catholic clergy in except for Jesuits. Jesuits may still not set foot in Norway. It is only in 1956 when Norway wants to sign the European Convention on Human Rights that the ban on Jesuits in Norway leaves the Norwegian constitution. Not because the Norwegians wanted those Jesuits, but because they had to do it to sign this nice do-gooding document that they wanted to sign. This is a typical attitude. Norwegians were liberals, so therefore we don't want Catholic clergy here. The other thing that you find throughout the Western world, you can find variants on this in the United States, in France, Germany, England, Italy, wherever. It's sort of an anti-Catholic parallel to the Jewish blood libel of the Middle Ages. Uh, in the Middle Ages, Jews were accused of murdering Christian children and using their blood during the Passover ceremonies to make matzah. Well, in the 19th century, the Catholic equivalent was that Catholic clergy would either kidnap or persuade a beautiful young woman to become a nun, get her into the nunnery, rape her, impregnate her. When the child was born, the child would be baptized, murdered, and buried inside the grounds of the nunnery. You will find best-selling versions of this story everywhere from Boston to Berlin. It's just all over the place and put forth by otherwise fairly respectable liberals. So there is a wider issue that this anti-Catholic aspect of 19th century liberalism is really um, in the book for. And that is to say, liberals have never been quite sure what to do with truly illiberal people. And the, certainly there were very illiberal Catholics around, although Catholics have not been the only uh, illiberals uh, in human history. Uh, far from it. You know, to what extent does toleration have to be extended to Nazis and fascists or people with fanatical religious beliefs? This is what Karl Popper called the, the paradox of tolerance that by granting too much tolerance to the intolerant, um, you essentially spell the end of tolerance because when those people take power, they will not be tolerant of you. This is something of the situation that liberals face today vis-a-vis -vis a certain kind of populist. Uh, one can think about everything from you know, anti-vaxxers uh, to all kinds of other issues, but it's an issue that liberals have never really worked out a satisfactory response to. And the 19th century liberal response was often what we would see as excessively intolerant. Uh, but the libertarian response is to say, we'll simply withdraw, runs into Popper's paradox. And so the relationship between liberalism and religion is meant by the core of liberal thinking to be a positive one, but has never been without negative elements. And as a result of those negative elements, post-World War II, many liberals simply try to avoid talking in religious language at all, to avoid talking about religious or even moral subjects. And I argue in the book that this is on the long run a source of weakness, that human beings are moral creatures, that human nature abhors a moral or religious vacuum. This indeed is one of Tocqueville's points. And that for the freedom from fear to be established, it has to have a moral and indeed probably a religious pillar as well as political and economic pillars. I mean, it's interesting. Do you think then from that perspective, it could be said that liberalism laid the seeds for its own destruction in a sense, because I sort of got the impression as I was reading your book, there were a lot of people in it. I mean, Tocqueville, Mill, many others 
who would say, well, religion is great, but it's not really for me personally, but other people should really go for it. Um, And to me, that's kind of, I mean, you're attempting to have your cake and eat it too, you know, because you're saying um, that, well, it'll be good, but you're, I mean, it's impossible to have a large group of people with genuine religion if, uh, if people don't actually believe it. And then at, at that point, as you know, there is kind of a power vacuum and all kinds of other things can come to fruition. I mean, w- would that be fair to say? Well, I think the, the response would be to say that this sort of liberal believes that people need to have deep moral commitments that those commitments do not necessarily come from religion. They can come from other things. Um, Nationalism is one example. Uh, Tocqueville also canvasses poetry and science as others. But the problem is that some of these things like deep moral commitments based on poetry or scientific inquiry are only really accessible to a relatively small number of people. And we have come to learn, especially since Tocqueville's times, that while nationalism may give people completely secular and very deep moral commitments, which they're willing to die for and to kill for, those aren't necessarily any more liberal than religious fanaticism might be. So liberalism knows what it wants to get from religion. It's found this to be a difficult process. It knows what it would like to get from nationalism. It's found this to be a difficult process. Today, there's been an effort to distinguish between patriotism and nationalism by certain people. Patriotism, good. Nationalism, bad. Uh, This is a very old attempt Uh, In the 1920s, R.G. Collingwood tried to distinguish between what he called sane and insane nationalism, which very much was the same as the patriot nationalism distinction. Uh, It's tough to do, just as it's tough to have deep religious commitments that may not become illiberal. It's possible, but it's not easy. So, no, no. Liberals don't have to cut off the moral branch they're sitting on. Many strive, in fact, mightily to maintain it. But it's not an easy perch. It's one where it's it's very easy to fall off. Uh, And the same is true with things like the nationalist perch um, or other kinds of, of deep moral commitments. This is why the end of ideology people thought, oh, maybe we're better off without this. But that's not possible either. Um, We're stuck with the humanity we have. Uh, And that humanity needs a source of moral grandeur. And we've yet to find a completely satisfactory one. And if we did, we wouldn't like it anyway. (laughs) I mean, I'm interested by the example of nationalism that you bring up, because one of the things that really struck me about your book in a surprising way was the difference in the way that you treated nationalism and populism. Um, And I, I I think people coming from a liberal camp in general are quite critical of nationalism, and you weren't positive about it, but you were fair. You, you said that, you said that it was worked well with liberalism in ways that I wasn't expecting. Um, But populism, on the other hand, which to me seems more kind of intrinsic, especially to democratic systems. I mean, populism requires, the whole point is voting, right? Populism requires buy-in from the people writ large. You were quite negative about. And it's also interesting because these are two ideologies that people often just lump together without differentiating and say nationalist populism. So Why did you, yeah, make that decision um, to talk about nationalism in a way that did work with liberalism, but populism in a way that does not? Okay, well, in part, it's simply a matter of history. If you said, for example, in 1845 in Germany, I am a liberal, you were almost certainly a nationalist as well. And vice versa. In 1845 in Germany, if you said, I am a nationalist, you'd almost certainly have said, I am a liberal. 
nationalism in certain times and places has in fact worked as a bulwark against fear. It means that we as a nation don't have to be afraid of other nations oppressing us. It means that we have this thing, our nationality, that brings us together, which can overcome the temptation to kill each other because you're Protestant and I'm Catholic. And so nationalism can be, in fact, a liberal thing. And in the early, what I call the short 19th century, which ends roughly, I say, the date John Stuart Mill dies, May 7th, 1873. Obviously, that's a rather arbitrary move on my part. But until roughly 1870 or so, nationalism and liberalism really work very well together. They reinforce one another's strong points. They help diminish each other's weak points. Nationalism helps liberalism become more inclusive. If we're all Germans, maybe we all should be able to vote, not just some of us. Um, if we're all Germans, maybe it doesn't matter that you're Catholic and you're Jewish and I'm Protestant and you're atheist. And all this is great. But beginning in the 1880s or the 1870s, this alliance begins to experience a whole lot more tension. It was never free of it, but it got a lot more tense in which nationalism became more exclusive and more inclined to make people afraid then take away their fears. And everything comes back to liberalism as a project of making a society in which no one need be afraid. The reason why populism in particular is always a liberal, whereas nationalism is not necessarily a liberal, is that if you look at populist movements around the globe, it is simply impossible to identify common populist policy positions. They take every conceivable policy position. But one thing that I believe populist movements have in common is an identification of some part of the nation as all of the nation. And those of you who are not part of the nation need to be afraid. So who this is may vary, but always somebody gets expelled. Oh, you're a cosmopolitan. Well, then you're not part of the people. So therefore, we're going to make you afraid. Oh, you're in fact the wrong ethnicity. Oh, you're an immigrant. Uh, all these people get rhetorically, and in the case of migrants, often physically expelled from the nation as populists see it. This is one reason why populists never actually lose an election. Because all the real people vote for them. The people who voted against them, at least the great majority of them, they weren't the real nation. They were the cosmopolitans, the homosexuals, the migrants, the people of the wrong skin color. Sometimes the wrong skin color is white. If we're talking about Bolivia and Evo Morales, white Bolivians aren't really Bolivians. Sometimes the wrong skin color is black. If you're black, you're not a real American for certain American populists. Um, but the details vary. But the populist move to make a certain portion of the actual human beings um, living there afraid is what means that populism and liberalism cannot be reconciled. Whereas populism, sorry, whereas liberalism and a certain kind of nationalism can be reconciled and have in fact been reconciled in certain times and places. In fact, perhaps you know, the, the best example of this is for much of the 19th century, an essential part of the British national identity was we are British, therefore we are liberals. And illiberalism, to be illiberal was to be un-British in some sense. Uh, you can't quite do that with populism. Uh, so that's why I make the distinction between populism and nationalism. Certainly nationalism contributes to populism. All populist movements are nationalist in some sense. Uh, it's an illiberal form of nationalism they adopt. What we f are faced with now, in my argument, precisely because liberals abandoned moral and religious language to a large extent after World War II, is the opposite of what John Rawls imagined. John Rawls imagined an overlapping liberal consensus that would dominate 
uh, the planet. What we have had recently is an overlapping illiberal consensus where people who are really quite different, secular nationalists of a certain kind, conservative Catholics, um, conservative Protestants, they know they're quite different from one another, but they overlap in illiberal ways and have come together to put liberalism on the defensive uh, all over the planet. Yeah, I guess my question would be, maybe maybe I should have asked first how you're defining populism, because from what you just said, it sounds as if populism just means illiberalism in some sense, which maybe maybe wouldn't be fair. I mean, I think to me, the most obvious definition of populism would simply be something that appeals to the masses as such, as opposed to the elite, in which case the elite probably have to be afraid because of populism. But at the same time, people who aren't part of the nation have to be afraid because of nationalism. Well, I think it would be a mistake to simply say that, you know, the people are the majority. Populism is the people. Uh, if you look at what drives the support for populism, it's not simply nationalism. It's what I, lots of things, lots of places have been talked about by lots of people. I sum this up in two words, cultural alienation. Uh, we used to have a common word in American politics that everybody used, left, right, and center. People used to talk about middle America. You do a Google Ngram search for the word phrase middle America, straight down in the past 30 years. Middle America no longer exists. It's been replaced by, on the left, flyover country, and on the right, the heartland. We have fragmented in how we see this massive set of people who have been culturally alienated by those who are sometimes labeled cosmopolitans. It's in fact a, a, a very large and, and disparate group, but by people who no longer speak a moral or religious language that is comprehensible to large numbers of people in the United States, in Poland, uh, in all kinds of places. And this, among other things, leads these people to reaffirm their identity, their cultures, their notion of moral behavior. And often they find, as far as they're concerned, those cosmopolitan elites, they have no moral response. They refuse to speak a moral language, which is a, simply a gesture of contempt in many ways. And so these people who feel themselves despised, overlooked, flown over, no longer those whose fears are taken into account by liberals, and this is certainly a liberal failing, have become illiberal in response or find in illiberalism a response, a response that has taken a, a populist form, a revolt of the heartland uh, against those who fly over them um, and, you know, can't bear to even look down. Hmm. I mean, then again, though, I think, you know, again, most of the thinkers in your book are primarily not moral thinkers. Maybe you'll disagree, but that was the certainly the impression that I got, and especially when you're talking about people like Bentham. And I mean, there, there's just a much more rich tradition of people who are talking about things other than where do we base our morality within liberalism than there is the opposite. So I kind of wonder if... It is part of the issue that they're just like, does liberalism have the tools to address people in the language in which they want to be addressed? Well, that's a, a really interesting question. So I do talk about Bentham. The chapter in which Bentham appears is liberalisms with something missing. And what's missing is, in fact, uh, typically, though not always, a moral pillar. Uh, Bentham is exclusively political in his focus. Bastia is exclusively economic. Uh, Herbert Spence is a bit of a more complicated case in that chapter, so I'll um, ignore him for now. <laughs> but if you look 
at people of the first generations of liberalism. Immanuel Kant, can we have a more systematic moral thinker? James Madison, who doesn't write a lot about morality, but who continually refers to the necessity for virtue and indeed the necessity for religion. Benjamin Constant, who talks about the necessary moral grandeur with which we have to infuse modern freedom. Macaulay, for whom some version of Christian religion is the basis of freedom. Tocqueville, who talks continually about moral grandeur. Even John Stuart Mill, who himself most of the time is an atheist and occasionally is a Manichaean. John Stuart Mill, who's deeply wedded to the notion of human perfection. That is to say, becoming better human beings, right? His great argument with Bentham, Bentham, who thought that any kind of pleasure was equally good, that uh, a happy drunkard was better off than an unhappy Socrates. Well, for Mill, it's the other way around, of course, that dissatisfied Socrates is, in fact, a better human being than a drunkard. And so although there have always been utilitarian elements in liberalism, and even though utilitarianism and what ph philosophers technically call perfectionism, the idea that human beings, what matters is becoming a better human being, not necessarily a happier human being, that you should try strive for excellence, not simply um, greater material or other utility. Utilitarianism and perfectionism have always coexisted in liberalism. They may be incompatible philosophical positions, but individual liberals have never had any trouble holding both of them in their heads at the same time. Sometimes Macaulay talks in purely utilitarian terms. Sometimes he talks in terms of moral perfection. Doesn't bother him. They bother the philosophy department. Too bad for the philosophy department. Uh, and it's precisely because liberals after the fin de siècle, and especially after World War I, talked less and less about perfectionism, about becoming a better person, that, in my view, populism has found a vacuum uh, in which to flourish, in which to enter. And liberals need to start talking more about, you know, being a good human being requires a society in which people don't have to be afraid, that you cannot, in fact, become better, or you are greatly handicapped in becoming a better person. Yes, a few saints can flourish even under the Soviet system, but the average human being will have more chances of becoming better, not simply richer, in a liberal and, among other things, free market society than they would in a communist despotism, which means liberals have to have some things to say about what it might mean to be a good human being. And people like Tocqueville and Mill certainly have things to say about why an unhappy Socrates is a better person than that happy drunk and why you should strive to be like Socrates as opposed to simply spending your time finding the cheapest bottle of whiskey. You know, let's talk a little bit about Mill because he keeps coming up. And I think in terms of these, are we, you know, are liberals moral? Are they not debate? He's in many ways like a really good example of this. Because um, in your book, you know, you note that On Liberty is a really divisive book within liberals and that there are a lot of different ways to read it. And I read it in its entirety for the first time pretty recently and immediately experienced that, where I read it and I, the atheism came through really strong for me um, and then was talking about it with my instructor. And he vehemently disagreed with me on that. Um, and I don't know. I mean, some of it was it sort of rubbed me the wrong way that he's going on and on about staying out of everyone's business and anti-democracy or whatever from his desk as a clerk at the British East India Company, um, which is about as intrusive into other, you know, other people's lives and what have you as a, a company could possibly be. Um, but why is it that there's so many different readings of this book? Um, what is the root of the disagreement within liberalism about it? That raises a whole lot of questions. <laughs> uh, 
One of the things that I do with Mill, which I think is a, a relatively unusual approach, is to ask not just what is he afraid of, intrusions into your liberty that are unjustified, but who is he afraid of, which is always an important question. And if you read On Liberty carefully, you discover that what Mill is afraid of is a sort of smothering Victorian middle-class morality enforced not just by direct state action, but by the action of society. And he sees in his famous harm principle a means of resisting not just the state, but of resisting certain kinds of social pressures. But at the same time, Mill says, while there are many ways in which we unjustifiably, excuse me, intervene in people's lives, both socially and through the state, there are other ways in which we ought to intervene in people's lives, and we don't do nearly enough of it. For example, Mill holds very strong beliefs on whether or not you really ought to be able to have children if you can't afford to feed and clothe them. And he's quite willing to see both social and indeed legal pressure put on people who violate that, which many of us would find a completely unjustifiable uh, intrusion into individual rights. So it's a book that is trying to do two things at once. The sort of A side, the side that people look at most often is the keep your own hands, keep your hands out of my business side of On Liberty. But the other side is the development of a very positive notion of individuality, of what human beings ought to be like, which includes that we ought to be willing to tell each other more often than we are, well, you know what? Um, your path in life is not necessarily the best one for human beings to take. And we ought to be willing to say this to each other and discuss this with each other a good deal more than we actually do. That doesn't mean the state should force you to take a particular path in life. Mill would certainly be opposed to that. Uh, but the we should engage in this kind of moral discourse far more often than we do, as opposed to using words like judgmental, uh, as we so often do in contemporary culture. Mill, I mean, the, the, the way I subtitle my, my section on Mill uh, is something like a, a world safe for struggle. Mill, Mill's notion of diversity is not everybody doing very different things in their own happy way and thinking, oh, it's just great that, you know, everybody likes a different color or, or something like that. Mill wants us to argue. He wants us to struggle. Even though Nietzsche thought he was a blockhead, in some ways he's really quite Nietzschean, except that unlike Nietzsche, he didn't think that the struggle is for some, you know, minority of aristocrats, but that in fact, everybody or almost everybody even horrors women, is capable of engaging in this struggle and ought to. And that a liberal society in which no one need fear is the kind of society in which we will have this continual struggle through which progress will come, both to us as individuals, because we don't really have our own opinions until we have effectively fought for them. And for us as a society, this is how we make moral progress. So in the service of this essentially moral perfectionist ideal, we need liberalism, the society in which no one need be afraid. And this requires for Mill political development, a free market society uh, in which private property exists, although I have recently held debates uh, about why Mill called himself a socialist and what he meant by this term. Uh, which we can also come back to, and it needs deep moral commitments in the exact way that Bentham ruled them out, right? Mill is horrified by pushpin is as good as poetry, Bentham's famous phrase. Bentham really didn't care um, if you like to go to Shakespeare plays or preferred video games. Uh, no, I guess I know video games did not exist in 1800, but pushpin <laughs> is the good one.
Well, I mean, it uh, sounds like Mill would have really liked social media, just the, the bringing of competition down into the, the most minute elements of daily life. Well, that's an interesting question because, of course, Mill did not experience social media. He certainly experienced um, a pretty gutter press. We tend to over-exaggerate the novelty of social media, although, of course, it is more rapid than anything that a newspaper could do in 1900. Perhaps our experience of the, the, the form that used to be called Twitter uh, might have changed Mill's mind. I doubt it. I think he would have thought we would get used to it and learn how to deal with it in one way or another. And that stifling debate would never be the correct solution to any problem. Uh, Mill is, although, you know, people like to say, oh, Mill is quite absolutist about free speech, but one of the most famous passages, people ignore the little brief mention thereafter in which he makes an exception in sort of obvious cases of the violation of public decency. Which means, so, yeah, um, certain kinds of, you know, public sex tapes, probably Mill's willing to, to see banned. Is that simply Mill being a Victorian uh, and he would have dropped that position or whether he would have maintained it? That's another debate. Mm. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we're running to the end of our time. I have a lot of follow-ups, but maybe we can chat after. Um, but I want to close us off here. I mean, I work at the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions, and American ideals and institutions are so closely entwined with the history of liberalism. And one of the things that really struck me about your book is that your history of liberalism really starts pretty contemporaneously with the history of America. Uh, one of the first thinkers that you list in your book is James Madison, and you talk about Locke as kind of a precursor to liberalism, which is also the role that he plays in the American experiment as kind of the prophet in the wilderness in some ways, um, or at least the way, to my understanding, a lot of the founders thought about him and were influenced by his thought. Um, so I'm wondering, based on that, is is America a fundamentally liberal nation? How how important is the history of liberalism to the history of America? Well, one of the sections in the introduction is titled, Why Not Lock? That is to say, how come my book starts really with Smith and Montesquieu and not with Locke? And despite a long historical tradition, uh, Lewis Hart's liberal, liberal tradition in America says America is all about Lockean liberalism. What I'm about to say is not my discovery. It's the work of the past 10, 15 years by primarily British historians of political thought. But it's going to come as a shock to everyone who's ever taken sort of political theory 101, especially in the United States. Maybe I should whisper this. <laughs> Locke isn't very important. <laughs> Locke is simply not considered a liberal until World War I and to a large extent until World War II. Locke is not even important in the United States after about 1778. This work is a quite old. Donald Lutz first did it in around 1980. You look at political speeches, rock writings, pamphlets in America, and Locke falls off a cliff quite soon after the Declaration of Independence. Why? Because the only thing Locke is good for, as far as the Americans are concerned, is justifying rebellion against the king. When you want to actually construct a liberal country, you don't turn to Locke. You turn to Montesquieu. You turn to Smith. You turn to all kinds of people, but Locke just isn't there. When Americans write their first political science textbooks around 1900 and they're describing the history of liberalism, what do they say? Liberalism begins with the Industrial Revolution and the American and French revolutions. That's way after Mr. Locke. It is only beginning in the 20s and especially post-World War II that people on the left and the right find it useful to make Locke central to the story of liberalism. Harold Lasky, 
British socialist, Rye in the 1920s wants to identify liberalism with laissez-faire economics and thinks Locke is a good way to do that. Friedrich Hayek, writing in the 30s and 40s, wants to identify liberalism with an Anglo-American as opposed to a continental tradition for various reasons. He's a little odd on this. He decides that Tocqueville is actually part of the Anglo-American tradition. Locke is a good way to do this too. So people with very different political views decide that Locke is really important. When Lewis Hartz writes his book in the 1950s about how America is all Locke and liberal, all the historians' reviews say it's a terrible book. It's the political scientists who say it's wonderful, don't actually know the history. Um, and Gail Arsenis, who's just published a book a few years ago about Locke in America, tells the same story I've just told you. So American liberalism is not Lockean, but America has been, with one glaring exception, a society dominated by liberal thought. The obvious glaring exception is slavery. Uh, I don't discuss slavery at length in my book because in this sense, unlike racism, slavery is a peculiarly American problem and American liberals never found a solution to it. Civil war not being a particularly liberal solution. And so while some form of liberalism has been as dominant in the United States as overall it's been dominant in European political thought, not always European political practice from the beginning, it's not been a Lockean liberalism. Nevertheless, it is fair to say that American political language, except for the debates about slavery, in which a whole lot of language is certainly anything but liberal, to be continued on in American debates over issues like Jim Crow and so on. Uh, American political discourse has lacked the kind of illiberals on the left and illiberals on the right that European political discourse has had. While still resembling it and following a similar chronology, American liberals under the name of progressives start worrying about poverty about the same time as European liberals do. People like Jane Addams are tremendously influenced by the British new liberals, by the French solidarists, and so on. So America is really not terribly exceptional in these kinds of respects. And it's even less exceptional now when populism is rising in America in very similar ways to which rise in other parts of the world. So yes, America is Madisonian. It's not Lockean. Mm. Um, I want to add also just briefly because we're we're talking under the auspices of the Madison Center that Madison's Madison's theory of faction in Federalist Number Ten is a centrally important contribution to general Western liberalism. Mm. Um, the way that factions can, in fact, play willy-nilly a positive role in creating societies that overall are free from fear is a really um, terribly important and terribly original insight that has been something that liberals have built on in all kinds of ways. John Stuart Mill doesn't cite Madison, but in this, he's, in fact, a very Madisonian kind of thinker. Hmm. Well, that is really interesting and also a fascinating note to end on, because I guess as an American, it hadn't really occurred to me that other places would be scrutinizing our founders so closely. Um, <laughs> so, again, thank you so much for the time. Your book was excellent. It'll be linked in the show notes for anyone who wants to purchase it. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Professor Alan Kahan on his new book, Freedom from Fear, An Incomplete History of Liberalism. The link to the book is in the show notes if you want to check it out. If you enjoyed this episode, please do go check out our website, jmp.princeton.edu. There, you can find recordings not only of our previous podcast episodes, but also of all of the speaking lectures that we have here on Princeton's campus. You can also sign up for our mailing list and see what events we have coming down the pike this semester. 
could also follow us on social media, on Twitter, at Madison Program, as well as on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I'm excited to see you next time here on Madison's Notes.